Um, my name is George Wesley Bright with uh, Washington Metro area based African Post newspaper and I'm doing this segment for the African Dream also based in the Washington Metro area in United States of America. Today I have with me Honorable Hassan Ayariga, presidential candidate for PNC in 2012 and then APC in 2016. Honorable Hassan Ayariga, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, great. thank it's you. It's a pleasure meeting you. A pleasure too. Great. What great. brings you to America? Um, a few things. Um, I was invited by the um, for a Dumba festival by the Atlanta Georgia Association of Northern Ghanaians okay. to be a keynote speaker okay. for the Dumba Festival okay. 2018. And uh, we had it, we're done. When was that? That was last week. Last week. In last week, Atlanta, yeah. Georgia. In Atlanta, okay. Georgia. Yeah, it, it was amazing. It was yeah. a wonderful okay. um, festival. Okay. And Is it, it an annual affair, something you always come to? I think it's an annual affair for the people of the northern region okay. in U.S. here. Okay. Every year they celebrate the festival, the Dumba festival. Okay. This year I was privileged to be the keynote speaker Great. and I was invited and uh, I came with my family and we went and graced the occasion. What part of northern Ghana are you from? I'm from Upper East, Upper precisely East. Boku. Boku. Yeah. Great. Are you in any way uh, related to Honorable Ayariga in Parliament? Oh yeah, Mama. Mama is my younger brother. Oh, he's your younger brother? From yes. The same father, same Yes, mother? yes. He's awesome. My Good to know that. He's my younger brother. Great. Mama is my younger brother. You just belong to different sides of the political divide. Uh, we used to believe in the Nkrumah's tradition and uh, our father was a former MP for the N uh, PNP. Okay. In the Third Republic under okay. the presidency of Doctor Hilal Imam, okay. and then he's he's late now. Okay. So when the NDC came looking for a good candidate yes. in 1992 to contest for the parliamentary yeah. elections, our house was the first point of call, and they wanted somebody from the family, and. Uh, Mahama Yaga opted himself for that okay. position. So your and father was a politician? Yes, yes. An honorable politician, honorable yes. Ayariga. Himself. So it's natural that two brothers are also uh, mm. in politics as well. Yes. So I hear you came from overseas and what made you go into politics? You started off with PNC and then you branched off to APC. Can you give us a timeline? What led to that? Uh, with the APC, that is a party I formed after I broke away from the PNC. The PNC is the party that uh, we all were. We were all in the PNC until um, 2015 when we went for the Congress and there were some kind of uh, malpractices which I didn't like. And I thought that this is a party that has voted several times for one candidate and i don't think it's necessary to continue we need to change from where we are in order to move on but if we decide to continue with that same candidate five times i don't think the party is serious and the party wants to win any elections because in winning elections you need to change strategies you need to change policies you need to change faces so if you keep on with one face and the fortunes of the party declines all the time you go into an election then I don't think it's good for the image of the party. And in any case, we're looking for the way forward of the party, not taking the party backward again. Okay. We saw you in 2012, 2016, you contested. Should we look forward to seeing you in 2020? Ah, uh, yes. I think that um, as young as I am, and the policies in which I portray and have, and the ideas, I don't think this is the end of the road. I think it's still the beginning of the road, so I'll still go 2020 with the APC. With the a APC. So how is your party? I see that you've had flirtations with NDC. When your party doesn't win, you flirt with the NDC, and then when it's time for elections, you go back to your party. So what is your relationship like with NDC? Are you, you some kind of alliance? No. What happened was that, you know, in 2016, when our party was disqualified, um, 
we waited for any political party to approach us for support. The NDC came, the CPP and the independent candidate wanted our support to endorse them in the 2016 general elections. So I gave out the details and I told the parties that, look, let's make a decision. I want region by region to decide on where to go. And if you agree on it, we'll have a next meeting and then we'll announce where the party is going. So I was out of the decision because I wanted the party to make the decision, not myself. So region by region should come out with their decision. So they endorsed the candidate then, President, former President Bahama, to go with. But because the MPP didn't come to us, there is no way we can endorse the MPP. So you could have gone with the MPP? We could have, the, the party could have gone with any. Okay. Not, uh, that wasn't my decision. Okay. And then beside that, people always think that Ayaga talks for the NDC. You see, it's, it's, it's sometimes uh, things are sit and laugh because it's, it's amazing the way people don't understand the issues and the relationship between APC, PNC, and CP, and, and then M NDC. We are all socialist political parties and we have the same ideologies and most of the time the same policies. So if I'm going to champion the case of a socialist political party, definitely I'll be doing the same like that of the NDC is doing. Okay. So we'll be all be defending the same ideology because we're a socialist okay. poli uh, political party. And that is why people always see us being together and working together. Yeah, looking at your manifesto before the elections 2016, people thought it was modeled after uh, the uh, MPP manifesto because NDC released their manifesto just thereafter you released yours and MPP. So it's like, oh, did he get a hint and copied the MPP manifesto? So what, looking at both manifestos so much alike, what would you do differently from what M MPP is doing right now? We, we almost had the same, or well, let's say similar policies. Okay. And um, there are a lot of things that relates to one another in terms of our manifesto NDS. But then we also differ in different ideologies because they are Democrats and we are socialists. So there are certain things that it, we don't click together, but there are certain things that we agree because we are a liberal principle socialist political party that believe in capitalism and socialism. So definitely we have some segment of our manifesto, okay, almost similar and that of the NDC again similar because of the ideological uh, uh, differences. But you see, for instance, we had an, in our manifesto, we spoke about an independent special pr prosecutor. Yes. In their manifesto, they spoke about a special prosecutor. So you see, there's a difference between an independent and a special, and a special prosecutor. Yes. That's the difference. And that is why today, even though we have actually created the office of the special prosecutor, I still see it that there's still loopholes to read. Because why? Let's take even the special prosecutor in question now, and that is uh, Honorable Martin Hamidou. Looking at the position of Honorable Martin Hamidou, he's been the longest serving attorney general in our history. Then he's now made the special prosecutor. Now, if you look at his, uh, his, 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 let me put it this way, his activities or what he's supposed to do in terms of his mission and his leadership chain, you realize that he's now going to work under a special prosecutor which before, he's been the special prosecutor before. So practically, he's been demoted again. Instead of promote, promotion, he's been demoted. Because you have been a longest seven special prosecutor. Now you come, a longest seven attorney general. Now you come and then they, you now work under an attorney general again. And not even attorney general, you're working under the attorney because you answer to the Attorney General. So, do you think, uh, so it's, if, if it was 
if it was an independent special prosecutor, his office will be an independent office, answering to nobody, just a, a new office created on its own to carry out activities independent. But the MPP manifesto allows him to be a special prosecutor under the attorney. So what's the essence of creating a special prosecutor under the office of attorney general if you know that the attorney general can do the job? So you don't think he's independent? He's not independent. That means that he's still a branch of the attorney general department, which, which is meaningless, which doesn't make sense to us in the APC. Because we think that if you're independent, you are. But if you're still working under another office, then you are just a, 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 a branch of it instead of being an independent. So you cannot work independently. You definitely have to go through somebody. And that is why... The choice. Do you think it was a deserving choice? To put Martin Hamidou there? Yes. No, 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 no. I disagree with the president. And even though I have great respect for both leaders, Martin Hamidou and the president himself, but I don't think that the office of the special prosecutor should be occupied by a card-bearing member of any political party. Okay. Or known to be a card-bearing member of any political party you will compromise that position. You either be for or against, which is definitely going to happen. You're not going to be independent. He can say whatever he wants to say, but that is his point of view. But for us, sitting from a different corner, and what we wrote in our manifesto, and if we want to work beyond partisanship and beyond political affiliations, such an office should not be related to anybody known to have held any office or any position in any political party and i disagree with that because he's either going to be for ndc or work against ndc or either be for mpp or work against mpp and this is not a special prosecutor i think he should be holding a position this way even though they call him citizen vigilante there are many people out there who can occupy that position martin almidu is not the only person qualified to hold that position. Yes. Uh, on this subject again, the mode of selection, the uh, president in consultation with the Attorney General, Attorney General recommended to the president to pick Martin Amidu as a special prosecutor, and he did. In your estimation, the mode of selection, how would you have done it? Would you have involved a broader base, uh, all the political parties, or set up a committee to find somebody? In the first place, it wouldn't have been under the special prosecutor. Okay. So the special prosecutor wouldn't have had any say yes. in the appointment of an independent yes, uh, the attorney general. attorney general it should it be an uh, attorney general so that the attorney general wouldn't have had any say under this circumstance okay so it would have been an independent body that would look at it it's good broader consultation is always the best solution on the option to go whether with political parties stakeholders people who matter and others broader consultation always give us a better resource that people accept it people agreed it people have confidence in and people have hope in it so we would have done a broader consultation we'll get names screen the people to see anybody qualify for that position because this is a position that is supposed to control or monitor or let's say quote and unquote try people who are perpetually alleged to be corrupt okay and finding solutions, retrieving resources that have been taken. So issues that are coming out right now in Parliament about some of them receiving double salaries and all, do you see it as a witch hunting by the government or you think these are um, genuine issues that need to be investigated? I think this is not about witch hunting. Okay. Um, sometimes I criticize the MPP for doing certain things that I don't believe and sometimes I applaud them for doing certain things that I believe. But they always believe in the criticism and living the part that I say they do good. For me, it's a good thing that the MPP have brought out this issue because it is impossible. We are in Washington now. Is it possible for you to be working for the Washington Post or the African Post? At the same time, they've given you an apartment. At the same time, you are taking man money for an apartment. Is it possible? No. <laughs> I don't think it's possible. That is the first question. Number two, if they say there were money pays into their account and they were not aware, I'm sure if they were not aware of the overpayment, 
definitely they'll be aware of underpayment. Because if they had paid them less, yes. they would have, they would have yes. <laughs> the authorities' attention. Exactly. Yes. To say, look, is, my salary is, I have not received my full salary. Yes. And it's underpayment. Yes. So they will go to the relevant institutions to make sure that it is properly done. Now that it's overpayment, or let's say allowances in one form or the other, it's not an excuse for you to be getting so much salary into your accounts and you don't find out where it's coming from. And even if you know where it's coming from, why don't you say, it? look, you haven't, I'm in the government bungalow, occupying a government facility, and then I'm still giving allowance for my rent. I'm taking double. And don't forget, these are people who are purported to be legislators who are supposed to pass laws, pass bills, to make sure that we are governed and not ruled. And when we are governed, we should be governed by the rules and regulations of our country and be follow these rules. These same people break these rules and expect the president to understand and then favor them. I don't think the president should do that. I think the president should allow the law to take its course. Even if he, the president, has paid, has received such in the past, he should be punishable. The law should punish all of them. Because it's, it's, uh, it's amount to me some form of mistrust, some form of, I don't want to say uh, 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 betrayal, but betrayal and then government losing a lot of money. People go to jail because of stealing a good. People go to jail because of taking mobile phones from artists. People are being sentenced because of minor, minor things. And why will a whole minister, a whole member of parliament, receive so much for a very long period, not just say one or two months and then it was detected and then it was reversed, several months. I think that we, we ought to be serious so, in this matter. Um, Nana has been in power for um, a year and five months. What are some of the things that you will see him and pat him on the shoulder that, Nana, you have done well with this? Can you mention some of that? Oh, uh, there's so many things that we can say about that. There are so many things also I can say that you didn't do yes. well. So let's talk about the things he's done well and some All of the right. you don't agree with. You think I, 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 to be very honest with you, I like people who want to fight corruption. Yes. The process of even not... Uh, Creating the office of an independent special prosecutor, but a special prosecutor is a good thing. That's number one. Number two, uh, the process of the paperless economy, okay. where they want Ghana to begin to go transparent, transparent procurement, uh, harbor process. processes, and other things. For me, it's a good thing. The issue of cashless yes. economy where we don't have to be using cash and other things. It's a good thing. Nobody would take it away from them. I like it. I would have implemented such policy. The issue of concrete, I'm told right now that they want to start concrete roads, yes. which is fantastic. Just like Nkrumah did with motor. Exactly. If we can do, because on and on, we, we contractors are awarded the same route 10 times in a year or 10 times in a particular government. They give you the casual road, you grid, you do some uh, shoddy works. Again, two years, they awarded the same. I mean, where are we going? So if we begin to do asphalt and then we do concrete roads, I'm sure concrete will last, last much it's longer. Cheaper. Even if it is not, it's cheaper to do concrete roads under the circumstances in which we find ourselves than giving the contract 10 times to one particular contract, a different contract. And we have the raw material for that? We do. <coughs> we, have, we have everything. Yes. We have stones, we have the dust, we have, I mean, everything that we need so to do feasible, it. Yes. It's feasible, just that we don't have the leadership to make decisions that we don't have to waste so much money and time constructing one road 10 times in, in, in two years. Okay, so I like that aspect. Even though we all want a perfect free senior high school, but this is not a perfect free senior high school. This is, and I, I always call it uncooked because the policy has no uh, a, a specific definition of where it should end. It is about where it should start. But it does not go further 
to show where it should end. Because if you say you, want, you, you you're putting up a free senior, it's good to have a free senior school. But the challenges that comes with it is huge. And they should have at least delayed the process of implementing the free senior school, maybe one or two years, and make sure they put structures in place before. Because former President Mahama started with a 200 senior high school. They should have continued to make sure they finish with the 200 school, make sure they have enough senior high school uh, facilities to accommodate the students then before they start. These are things that we know. Won't it take quite a bit of time before, once they are in power, because to construct 200 schools, it might take more than four years that they're going to be in power? It, 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 it can take less than six months, if only you have the resources. Okay. These are construction buildings that you want to put up, and you can construct them in six, one year, if you have the resources. And even though President Muhammad started with it, so they should have just continued. But they didn't, and abandoned it, and say they want to implement the policies, the numerous uh, uh, poli uh, what you call promises they made. But there are some of the promises that <laughs> they could have done it much better, much cheaper, okay? But they, uh, they, they opted to do the free senior high school in a rush to win political points. For instance, they've started with this NAPCO, the Nation, the Nation Builders Club. I see it has a loot and share kind of business. You see, you are trained as a graduate. You come out of school, and now you are sent back to go in between as a, poly, a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a polytechnic student or a tech a vocational student. Go and do vocational work. If you train people to be graduates, and you want to engage them into giving them jobs, you don't start by giving them unemployment benefits. The 700 Ghana cities they want to give to this is just to say, look, we have 100,000 foot soldiers of the MPP. We need to find them jobs. So let's say, okay, let's put up a model to say that we want to engage 100,000 students. And then we bring in 70,000 MPP foot soldiers in. And then we bring in 30,000 Ghanaian students from the outside just to create that model. Okay. And then we start paying them. Paying them for what work? So, okay. Because you, before you create jobs, you don't start giving salary before the job. On these you, create, you create the job mm -hmm. before the salaries. Has your party issued a statement on your stand on this? When I get back to Ghana, we're gonna, we're gonna issue a statement and we'll, we'll bring the model, we'll redefine the model, we'll tell how government is gonna loot, we'll show them where it's going, what are the advantages and disadvantages of it? Because at the end of the day, government is going to spend $191 million every year just to pay salaries to these young men who are just going to be masons. You have finished university and now you are, you are trying to become a mason. When we have masons out there. Okay. In is it job creation or some form of looting? I know you're a businessman, a very successful businessman as such. And so, talking about, so how is the business outlook since MPP came to power? Something you would have done different to boost business or they are, you think they are on the right track in terms of business? I think that business has gone down uh, drastically in Ghana uh, because initially, initially when they came, people had the hope and confidence that things were going to change. But as time went on, by day by day, things were rather retrogressing instead of moving well, what on. What do you think accounts for Bec that? I, I, I think that what accounts for is that when you have made so many promises that are not feasible, and you have no blue, blueprint, and you were saying it just to win political power, and now you win the political power, and you didn't know that you were going to win and you won the power, now without a blueprint of all the things you were saying, it becomes a problem to implement them. So, so you get stranded. Uh, projects that are not feasible, uh, going back to the free SHS, there, we didn't have um, things in place before they established the free SHS because they just wanted to impress the people. But looking at it, let's take politics aside. Would you rather not have a child study on the bare floor then have the child stay at home and say, let me finish putting up the building before you go into the classroom. I am totally for the free senior high school. Okay. But when I said that they did not put up a blueprint, you see, 
The policy of the MPP is yes, free senior high school. They've implemented it. But what is after the free senior high school? What is the way forward after free free senior high school? That is what I'm talking about. Okay. You see, you you want to train your students. Yes. You must know at what level you want them to stop, or at what level you want them to reach. So you say free senior high school is the basis on which I want to give them. So every year we assume that. Before you came in, there were 100,000 students going into the secondary high school. Now, because it's free, another 100,000 has doubled, making it 200,000. Don't forget, in the next two years, these 100,000 schools that you were students that were getting accommodation into the universities have now doubled. So what have you done? You have only increased the enrollment in, at the free senior high school and facilities at the free high school, and you've left the tertiary. So they get to the tertiary and they are choked okay. so and there is no way, they don't know where to go. We have more people coming from the senior high school. To the tertiary yeah. and you did not take okay. steps to increase the facilities at the tertiary. Okay. That means that when they finish, they'll be mass drop out. Because why? Or they come out and a lot of them cannot get access into the tertiary because the tertiary is full. If you increase the base, you increase the top. You don't just increase the base and reduce the top. If you're building the house, you, you start with the foundation, you have to go with it. But if you go up and say you want to expand again, or you want to reduce, <coughs> then sorry, you have a problem there. Okay. So for me, I will say they should go ahead, or, unless they have the policy to treat students to the free senior high school and leave them there. And say, okay, we are giving you a basic education of free senior high school. The standard is that at least every Ghanaian should be able to be educated to the senior high school level. That is fine. But if you go beyond that, then that means one, you need to expand tertiary institutions. Two, either you expand vocational institutions. Are you with me? Yes. So that when the number gets to the, after the senior high school, they will have facilities in where the rest of them can get into. Mm -hmm. But in this government, no. They were just free senior high school, free senior high school. You have implemented it what the effect after the free senior high school. This is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the free senior high school being bad, no? But you train us, we get to the tertiary level, and then we are stranded. So they will vote against you. Honorable Ayariga, you know, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, and I'm, I'm so impressed with your input on issues about governance. And I see that you could, yes, you're ready for, um, you're ready to be a good presidential, candidate and a president in the future. Thank you. So there's this sensitive issue that came up in Ghana recently about um, the U.S. military base or U.S. military presence in Ghana. You joined the demonstration on horseback. What is your take on that? I think that um, the U.S. military base in Ghana is one of the things that uh, no matter what it is, I don't agree with it. Because one, um, when you look at the agreement between Ghana and then the U.S. and then you see that it favors the American cities, Americans than the Ghanaians. What is it that the Ghanaian is there to benefit? And when you look at it, you don't see any benefit relating to Ghana. And that is why we were against that. We say, okay, if, if, even if at worst we want that agreement, it should be a form of reciprocate. In the sense that if you can come to my country without me controlling you or having access to my military, uh, what do you call it? going through security and going through immigration i should be equal i should be able to go to your country the same without going through security checks without going through immigration but in case of ghana it's not the same if you have free access to my radio spectrum i should also be able to have free access to your radio spectrum. i don't think the Ghanaian military can have free access to the radio spectrum in the u.s no if you say that certain things that i send into your country free of charge free uh, um, taxes, free duty and other things. I should be also be able to send things like that. These are the things that we see that actually it does not favor the Ghana, uh, the Ghanaian military men or Ghana as a nation. There's a lot of things and I, if we want to go on and on because of the time, we will get to the point where we realize that we are selling our sovereignty in the sense that you, the U.S. has overpowered the Ghana army. In any case, what is the importance of this mission? If we want to say this is the way to go, then we should benefit on the same level with the Americans. I am not against any deal with the Ghanaian 
or the military. But I'm against anything that will undermine our sovereignty. Look, for 61 years we've lived in peace. No record of war with any country. No violence after independence. We fought for our own independence. Americans did not come to help us fight for our independence. Where were they when we were looking for independence? That was when we needed a U.S. military base to help us fight for independence. Now we've got independence. We've, we have been living for 61 years in peace and harmony with our neighbors. Now you say you want to come and help us fight terrorists. Which kind of terrorists are you talking about? Yes. Um, are you with me? Yes. Yeah. Honorable Ayariga, you know, um, at this point, viewers would like to know more about you. What is your website address so that we can go read up more about your manifesto? your take on issues that are going on right now in this country. Do you have a website? Yes, we have APC. Presence? Yes, my website is Hassan Ayerga. It's my Facebook page. Hassan Just Hassan Ayerga. .com or .org? Just Hassan Ayerga yeah, okay. That's my Facebook okay. page. And then my Twitter too is Hassan Ayerga. And then with the APC, we have APC Ghana. Dot com, and you go to APC and then you find our party. Now what we do in the party is trying to uh, reorganize the polling stations to get 20 membership in each polling in each station. Polling station. Each, of the each of the 290, 290. 90, yes, to each polling stations. And now what we want is the young men should come out and take leadership positions. This is time for the vibrant youth of Ghana to begin to see the future in their own hands. They should not expect that they will sit and the Ghanaian politicians will call them and say, take my position. It's not going to happen. And we have seen the leadership of the NDC. We've seen that of the MPP. We've seen it over and over again. And I tell you, this is the last hope for the NDC and the MPP regime. If Nana should fail, I don't think Ghanaians will accept NDC and MPP again. They'll be looking for a third force. And the third force is the APC pushing further, believing in ourselves. So we're creating a platform. I, I hope you look, you're not looking forward to another failing. Uh, oh, <laughs> no, no, but that's, that's, that's it. Because the, the hope has, we have gone to the extreme end okay. that the two political parties have exhausted their mandate now. So if Nana should fail, that's the end of the both parties. And Ghanaians will not give mandate to the two parties anymore. Ghanaians will be opting for a third option. And this third option is the APC, which gives everybody the equal platform, the opportunity to call, to exhibit and to promote our way of living. We have PPP and many others. What makes you think? Uh, oh, they've been silent. Uh, these parties have been silent for, for long. Uh, they are not proactive like the APC. The APC has 276 offices across Ghana in less than two years. In less than a year, we were formed. We are able to represent ourselves all over this country. You're the sole financier of this. I am the sole financier, but we will be looking for more financiers to come and help the party are and you push. A rich man? <laughs> I'm okay. okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. So, what are you also as a uh, successful man doing for your people in the north? Uh, uh, right now, I'm putting up a, um, not just in the north but in Ghana, I'm putting up a 220 million dollar hospital okay. in Hachu. Okay. Uh, to to help in promoting healthcare delivery, it's it's in three blocks, block A, B, and C, and we're going to have a helipad at the rooftop. That will, one of the blocks is going to contain uh, presidents and African leaders who always travel from Africa to go abroad looking seeking for medical care. So that section is meant for the VIP, the executive section, which will accommodate presidents in Africa, ministers and all those who think they have travel outside, outside medical, for medical, yes. so they can come to Ghana. Yeah. So it's going to boost our economy as well. Yes. And then the other section, which is a thousand five hundred bed capacity, is going to be the ordinary people like us, you and I, who are still struggling to survive. And then whatever we make from the executive section, we'll use that money to sponsor some of the free medical care we want to give to the thousand so it's going to be 2500 bed capacity thousand for the executive thousand five hundred for the ordinary so Ghanaian. what are some of the business uh, ventures you are involved in right now in ghana oh i do a lot of things i mean to real estates i do uh some college um i do construction um, a lot, a lot. Okay. Yes, anything that is good for our people. So you're creating employment. For okay. creating a lot of employment. Yes. I'm creating a lot of employment and the quiet. And then we're there. We're moving on. What we want is that 
we should all the leaders i'm calling on leaders of africa not only ghana to begin to see the presidency not has an adventure for making money but an opportunity to change the lives of our people we shouldn't see the presidency as an avenue to become rich but an avenue. sometimes i sit at home and i ask myself if i become president what will happen after i've left the presidency because i'm going to do so much to the extent that if i'm leaving I definitely will have to put institutions that I hope that my, 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 my successors will continue with it. That's my fear of becoming a president. My only fear of becoming a president is after the presidency, what will the people do after what I've done for our nation? Because I'm going to push our country to challenge the rest of the world. And I think we can do it. We're only too lazy. If we're not lazy, we, 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 we just want to enrich ourselves, thereby leaving the rest to suffer. We have gone to school. We've been educated to do what? To transform the lives of people, not to take away the opportunities we should give to the rest. But that's what we do. Politicians get the opportunity, and instead of promoting their people, they rather demote their people to become rich. And the rest of the people are suffering. That is not the way to go. We've done it all. Every African leader have studied the African leader, and most of them is what they are doing. That's why we're not moving. We have all the resources we can think of. Diamond, gold, bauxite, oil, manganese. But Africa is so poor that we can give three square meals to our people. You ask yourself why? And it's boiled back to the leaders. The people we claim they are going to exonerate us. The people we claim they are going to transform. These are the people who are really killer. If we could even do without them, we would have been doing better. So grateful, so grateful. It's been a pleasure, Honorable Hassan Ayarega. So nice talking to you, nice talking to George you too. from African Post. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. George.